Bryce Kemp uh, over in St. Louis. Uh, he, he is an expert uh, uh, speaker, uh, is called upon by uh, several organizations, including the Sterling Christ Camp, uh, does a, a lot of things. Uh, so he's, uh, uh, we're, uh, I'm expecting very great things from you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I should just leave now. No pressure, no pressure. I don't, I don't have a chance of living up to that. <laughs> yes. If I stand here, everybody all right? If somebody needs to move, feel feel free okay. to, to, to get the position where you can. Yeah. Where you well, can John, John has, uh, among other things, just become <clears throat> the president of the uh, uh, Civil War Roundtable over in St. Louis, uh, a very prestigious uh, uh, position. Uh, of course, prestigious means you have to work harder than anybody else. But, uh, uh, he uh, he has earned his stripes and uh, knows his stuff, and uh, uh, John, without further ado, sir. All right, so the title of the, top of the talk, it says on your handout, Missouri Home Guard. That is incorrect. Hopefully by the time I'm done, you'll know the difference between the Missouri Home Guard and the Missouri State Guard. I'm going to be talking about the Missouri State Guard, which I will call the Patriot Army of Missouri. Uh, does anybody know what this flag is? Missouri, I think. Missouri. Yeah, I think Missouri. That's not the Missouri State flag. No. Uh, the Missouri State flag has that seal, but it also has some red and white, uh, I forget what, what color stripes. There was no Missouri State flag at the time of the Civil War, but there was a state seal. So it was dictated that the flag would be uh, the, Missouri, the seal uh, on blue merino wool. So that, that's where that flag comes from. So. I outline what I'm going to talk to you tonight. This will be this will be fairly simple, straightforward stuff. A little bit of a prelude of what led up to this. To the, we'll go real quick through that because you all know what led up to the to the war. Uh, the organization of the State Guard. What happened in 1861, which was kind of the high water mark for the Guard. Uh, what happened in 1862? Because there's something going on there. And then what happened after? Because there was still some Guard uh, activity going on all the way to the end of the war. So. You all know that Lincoln was elected before he's even before he is even inaugurated. Uh, the seven states of the Deep South secede. Uh, Missouri holds a state convention a, a month later to decide whether they should secede or not, because the seven states of the Deep South are, are contacting all the other slave states and trying to get them to to join. Uh, but at that point in time, uh, in Missouri and in many of the states, they decided, well, there's no, there's no advantage to us to, to, to leave the Union right now. So many of them are what we would call conditional unionists. will stay in the Union provided that they don't try to coerce the other southern states back into the Union, which we all know how that worked out. So about another month later, Fort Sumter occurs. And that's when Lincoln calls for troops, calls for 75,000 troops. Now we're talking about coercion from in the mind of those conditional unionists. Uh, what do you think that the governor of Missouri answered? The Missouri's, Missouri's quota was four regiments. Uh, he three, said, no, 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 no. Not one man shall we give to your unholy crusade. It's, it's actually a very kind of a flowery speech if you ever want to read something. But he, he replied a couple of days later and said, no, no, we're not, we're not going to provide manpower. Uh, April 20th, the, uh, there was a, there was a um, arsenal in, Lib in Liberty, Missouri that was uh, seized. Uh, that was sort of happening all through the South, that, uh, even in the states that didn't uh, secede. The Little Rock, uh, Arkansas uh, arsenal was, was captured before Arkansas actually seceded. So this was a federal arsenal yes. seized by the southern by, by the state, seized by the state effectively. Now, in the case of the Missouri Depot, that's true in Arkansas. In the Missouri Depot, it's unclear how much uh, the governor was aware of this. We believe he was aware, but whether he really did actually ordered it or not, that's not clear. But on May the 6th, he orders that the state militia, this would be, this would be the pre-war militia, the locals, who formed militia companies um, were ordered to muster and train their annual do, do their annual training in St. Louis. Um, but on May the 10th, 
Now, in other words, there was a feeling that the militia was going to try to capture the larger arsenal in St. Louis. Uh, that had been their original intent, but Nathaniel Lyon, who was a U.S. Army captain who had been sent from uh, Fort Leavenworth, uh, actually Fort, excuse me, Fort Riley, Kansas, to St. Louis to help reinforce uh, the arsenal, had gotten wind of this and had already moved almost all the all the munitions out of the arsenal. So it was a dead issue. There was, there was really no intent to go and capture the arsenal at this point in time. Uh, they did, however, have two, have two cannons that had been set by Jefferson Davis that had been captured in the Camp Rouge arsenal. And they got wind of that, and they knew that those were at Camp Jackson. Uh, so Captain Lyon, who by this time has been pro uh, promoted to appointed uh, Brigadier General of Volunteers marches down to the camp, surrounds it with an uh, uh, overwhelming uh, number, of, number of troops, and demands that they uh, surrender, and they have no choice. They're out there outnumbered uh, to such a large amount. As they're lining them up to march them back to the arsenal to parole them, instead of just paroling them there, uh, this is, these militia musters would have been largely like uh, Fourth of July sort of a type of event, and so, so all the locals are there picnicking and watching watching the parades and all that stuff go on. Um, so all these southern, more southern sympathizers than not are in are in the audience, yes. and there's a lot of cat calling and finally some rock throwing, and finally a shot is fired. Not clear who fired the first shot, but this uh, the lion's troops fired into the crowd. Because, because the state militia had already stacked their arms. They weren't armed at this point in time. Uh, so they did most of the damage regardless of who fired the first shot. Uh, what, at least one woman and one child was killed. Immediately the following day, the state government creates the Missouri State Guard. They pass what's called the military bill, creating the Missouri State Guard. And that's what leads us to, uh, into this. What happens with, with this is that the old Missouri Volunteer Militia is disbanded. There's no longer the old original pre-war militia. Uh, in the Adjutant General's report for 1860, there were only like, uh, well, less than 1,500 men in the militia across the entire state, most of which were in St. Louis, a few in Springfield and St. Joseph, but uh, very, very limited. To be in the Missouri State Guard, you had to be between 18 and 45. That would have been about over 200,000 uh, men would have been available for service. The Home Guard was outlawed. Home Guard was those sort of unofficial militias that were raised on their own. Now, Lyon and some of his buddies, Frank Blair uh, in particular, conspired uh, to raise these Home Guard companies particularly in St. Louis amongst the German population. Um, and they, many of these were the men he used to capture Camp Jackson. But that now is uh, officially outlawed. But by the governor? By the governor. The governor is still in uh, Jefferson City at this point. It's also organized into nine divisions, basically going by the political divisions of the state. My ancestors were in the 7th Division in South Central Missouri. So I, I'm trying to find more and more about, about them. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. What were the leanings of the people who lived in Cherokee County? Do you know, you know what Cherokee County is? Well, Cherokee County, of course, was the home of Sterling Price, oh. wasn't it? I have no idea. I believe. <laughs> so, no matter where you went, though, it was mixed. Now, it's interesting that there were pockets in places that wouldn't make sense. The north north part of the, of the state was not necessarily Union, and certainly the south was not necessarily secessionist. Uh, Springfield had a fairly large uh, uh, Union uh, sympathy. And, of course, shortly after the war, after all the southern sympathizers go off to join the state guard, we're left with mostly Unionist uh, at home. Can I answer your question? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a large black community in Cherokee County that was slaves. Yeah, which, which probably developed after the war. Yeah. 
So Sterling Price, a former uh, governor and former uh, Mexican War hero, was appointed as Major General in overall command of the State Guard. Each division had a Brigadier General appointed. Most of these were lawyers and people that were more political appointees than anything else. The division, division is an un, unfortunate term in my mind. When you think of a division in terms of military and armies, you think of a pretty large uh, organization. Uh, but they were really more like brigades. They were a, a collection of regiments that would have made uh, more something closer to a brigade. At uh, Wilson's Creek, for example, the entire 7th Division was 645 men. Two, two companies and a 45-man independent cavalry company. That was a, quote, division. The seventh was one of the smaller divisions. Uh, the previous military experience, experience of the officers who served in the, in, the, in the Missouri State Guard was pretty limited. Ten of them were, had previously been U.S. Army officers. Twelve had been U.S. Army enlisted men. 235 had fought the Mexican War. Eight had some sort of foreign military service. Uh, Thirty-seven had graduated from West Point or some other military institute. And 30 had been uh, pre-war militia officers uh, at some point in time. So fairly limited compared to, think now that the Union is the old U.S. Army with all the people that had whatever training that they had. Uh, how many men are in a company? It's supposed to be us. In the Confederate States of America, that would be true, but under the Missouri State Guard, it's much less. Uh, infantry company in the Missouri State Guard was between 34 and 84 men. It could be as small as 34. Uh, and they had, they had a captain, the first, second, and third lieutenant, the fifth sergeant, the fifth corporal, and two musicians. Uh, a regiment, how many, how many companies in a regiment? Ten in the Confederate States of America, and the Missouri State Guard, it's six to eight oh. companies or batteries. Um, and they would be led by a colonel, and a lieutenant colonel, a major, an adjutant, a quartermaster sergeant, sergeant major, a quartermaster sergeant, a color sergeant. So you could have 200 men in the regiment. Yeah, the, my uh, ancestors fought in a regiment that had 300. And the, and the other regiment that served with them at Wilson Street had 305. Um, what is a battalion? Four or five companies. Basically, it's a short regiment. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it, it's not quite enough companies to make a regiment. So in the case of uh, State Guard, it's three to five cavalry companies or two to four infantry companies. And they would only have a lieutenant colonel or a major, depending on how many companies were now, 1861, things are, things are kind of heated up because you know, we've had this um, Camp Jackson affair, and, um, and, the, and, the, and they've been called out. Uh, not, they're not sure where to go or what to do yet. But Sterling Price uh, is, is friends with uh, General Harney, who William S. Harney was a uh, U.S. Army general, one of the few actual generals before the Civil War. And he lived and was stationed in St. Louis. So Price and Harney made an agreement to let's, let's let things cool down here. We'll go home as long as you agree not to bring U.S. forces into the state. Any farther than they are, they were already in St. Louis, of course. And that was the standing agreement. Well, Lyon and Frank Blair didn't really care much for this idea. So they, through political maneuvering, get, get, get uh, General Harney replaced. They're getting replaced by Cap Captain, now Brigadier General Volunteer Lyon. And so Lyon replaces Harney, you know, uh, only a week or so later. So Price and the governor are concerned, is he going to honor the agreement? So they meet in St. Louis on June the 11th at the Planters House, which was the biggest hotel downtown. Actually, they had asked for Lyon to come to Jefferson City to meet with the governor, which would seem appropriate to go and meet with a governor. But no, he says, no, you come here. They come to St. Louis. They said, well, come meet us in St. Louis. They said, no, you come down to Jefferson Barracks. Finally, he relented and came and met them at the planter's house. What was the result of that meeting? 
Lyon declares war on the governor of Missouri, on the state of Missouri. A U.S. Army captain declared war on the state of Missouri. Immediately following uh, the governor, first, first of all, immediately following, uh, he says, I'll have the uh, U.S. court outside my lines in an hour. And so the governor and Price and whoever's with him jump on the train, head back to Jeff City, burning bridges behind them as they go. Uh, meanwhile, Lyon, the, the governor calls for troops uh, immediately. Uh, he calls for 50,000, but probably only gets about 15,000 initially. On June the 14th then, um, the governor hears that Lyon is coming, so he abandons the state, uh, he, the, the state capital. He grabs up the state seal and what things he can take, and, and they head west and south. Lyon arrives in Jefferson City on June 14th. It's pretty much abandoned by then in terms of the government. Uh, Siegel arrives in Rolla. He took the train, which of course went as far as Rolla and stopped. The 17th, by the 17th of June, Lyon has got on boats and gone up to Boonville, where there is a battle, one of the first battles of the war, um, which is more of a delaying action because the state guard is trying to get south so that they can get organized. But they're largely unarmed at this point in time and untrained. Uh, in 19 June, there's a, a, another uh, skirmish at Coal Camp, which Many of these skirmishes end up being recruiting camps that someone comes across, uh, and then there's a skirmish that will develop from that. These are Confederate uh, camps that uh, the Union The Coal Camp was actually a home guard camp, and the Confederates came upon them. Okay. Um, at Carthage, um, State Guard is the State Guard is coming south along the western border. And they get down near Carthage. Remember, uh, General Siegel had gone to Rolla. He went on, he continued on to the western border, basically, and got in position at Carthage to intercept the state guard that was coming. Uh, he, he was largely outnumbered, although maybe not outgunned, but largely outnumbered. And uh, basically, he had, to, he had to retreat. Probably the only time, uh, nobody retreated better than General Siegel. <laughs> this is probably the one time I know where it was appropriate for him to retreat. Um, so he, he basically, so, and the uh, state guard continued on to the southwest corner of the state, which was called Cowskin Prairie, and began training and trying to arm and trying to get uh, equipment. Because most of these guys were wearing what they had on their, on their backs when they left home, and they're carrying their squirrel rifles and shotguns that they brought from home. John, uh, at this point, we're talking four months, uh, basically three months after the beginning of the, the war. If you, if, you, if you use Fort Sumter as the beginning right. of the war. Now, at what point does Fremont uh, do uh, martial law throughout the state? Uh, well, it, come, it comes shortly after this, but not too much. Fremont, uh, I'll, 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 actually, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, so at Cowskin Prairie, he's got 9,000 men, but only 5,000 of them have weapons of any kind, and many of those would be fairly primitive weapons. Uh, so the state's now cut in half at the Missouri River because the Union has, uh, the unionists have, have uh, moved, moved into the state. So people coming from the, from the northern uh, areas have trouble getting down to join them at this point in time. Fremont takes command on the 25th of July. Anybody know how many days he's in command? The rest of the war. No. In, in, he's only in command in, in Missouri for 100 days. Exactly 100 days. Uh, the, the, so now the Unionists decide to appoint a quote provisional unquote governor. So at this point, Missouri has two governors, one Union, one Confederate. Our Confederate governor, of course, is ex in exile, but he is the legally elected governor of the state. Uh, the state guard then gets assemb all assembled at Cassville, which is in the southwest part of the state. Uh, my uh, ancestors from the 7th Division 
now joined them in Cassville, so they weren't with them at Boonville or Carthage, but they're now with them in Cassville. Additionally, at Cassville, they're joined by Confederate troops under Benjamin, uh, General Benjamin McCullough and Arkansas state troops under, the, uh, under Pierce. Now, why the uh, Arkansas guys came into the state, I'm not totally sure, except I'm thinking they, they were thinking they were protecting their northern border. Union would continue on south if not uh, stopped. So as they're moving north, the first skirmish occurs at a place called Doug Springs. And it's basically they're looking for each other. Nobody knows who's where, how many men anybody has. And the lead elements uh, run into each other and start shooting and then sort of running back in both directions. Uh, now McCullough uh, refers to this as Rain's Scare. Because Brigadier General Raines, who was in charge of the 8th Division, was in the lead with uh, the cavalry uh, looking for this. And they came charging back through the camp. So uh, McCullough has lost much of his confidence in these guys. Uh, but moving on then, on the August the 5th, our Confederate governor, our legitimate governor in my mind, uh, declares Missouri to be an independent state. There's a battle in the very northeast corner of the state, almost on the uh, Iowa line. Matter of fact, some of the cannibals fell in Iowa, a place called, called Athens, um, which is really another one of those recruiting sort of uh, events. But on the 10th of August, um, we're continuing from Doug, from Doug Springs up towards Springfield, trying to find and engage Lyon and his troops. On the 9th of August, they finally agree that they're going to move on Springfield and attack. Uh, however, it starts to rain a little bit, and since they don't have leather cartridge pouches or just cloth, they're afraid their munitions are going to get wet, so they decide to postpone it. But Lyon comes out of Springfield and runs into the State Guard at Oak Hills or Wilson's Creek. Y'all familiar with the Battle of Wilson's Creek? And who won? We did. And in fact, Siegel was the first man back to Springfield. I told you he retreats better than anybody. And they retreated actually all the way back to Raleigh shortly thereafter. So martial law is declared on the 14th of August. By, by, the new by, by Fremont. By Fremont. By Fremont, yeah. So as far as I know, the Confederates never declared martial law. Uh, his emancipation, uh, Fremont's emancipation, was the 30th of August, which, which is partly what got him, mostly what got him fired. But you can point to other reasons too. Uh, now, Price now wants to continue on. McCullough and the Arkansas troops won't continue with him. Remember, we're not part of the Confederacy at this point in time. We've declared ourselves to be an independent state, but we've not seceded and we have not joined the Confederacy. So Price moves north with 10,000 men, more or less along the Kansas border. On the uh, 1st and 2nd of September, a place called Big Drywood Creek, which is just east of Fort Scott, he <coughs> runs into some of General Lane's men from Fort Scott, and then he, de and he defeats them in a battle of what's often called the Battle of the Mules, because they captured a bunch of mules and horses uh, from Lane's guys. So that was a fairly small skirmish. Uh, there was another skirmish that now they're moving, continuing to move north towards Lexington. There's a battle called Liberty of Blue Mills Landing, and that's troops from the north trying to get across the Missouri River in the Liberty area uh, to join uh, to join Price. And they most of them make it across, but there are some losses there. But then, uh, as Price gets into Lexington, he surrounds the uh, troops that are there up on the top of the hill and uh, basically it's a siege and they uh, basically and they haven't really laid their fortress out very well because they're the water's outside their outside their boundaries so largely because they couldn't get water they couldn't stay very well. Uh, the state guard now has about 20,000 men assembled but probably only 15,000 of them are armed. Can everybody see the cannonball? That's in, that still exists there. Uh, 
and the Lexington Courthouse. Now, I heard a story, it may be apocryphal, it may, I don't know if it's true or not, but in the 1920s or 30s, they were standing out in front of the courthouse and it fell out. I <laughs> looked at them and said, what to do? Well, they put it back. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, now, Price would have liked to stay in the north, but he really can't. By this time, the union is getting their act together. Uh, John, yes. we got a couple of people back this side. They're a little harder hearing. All you right, I'll, 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 try, I'll try to project as well as I can. Thank you. Um, this, though, is probably the high water mark for the Missouri State Guard. Price would have liked to stay and even gone farther. However, by this time, um, the Union is, is descending on him from all directions, from Kansas, from Iowa. Uh, and so he has to fall back south. But from this point, there are recruiting detachments still going out. A place called Monday Hollow or Wet Glaze was another one of those where a whole bunch of Confederates were captured and many of them killed. Uh, Jeff Thompson, everybody knows about him, Jeff Thompson, he, uh, to take some pressure off of Price, he starts up some operations in the southeast, uh, Missouri, uh, including Big River Bridge and Fredericktown and a bunch of other skirmishes. And he's successful in both of those. Uh, Fremont finally gets to Springfield on the 25th of October. Uh, his bodyguard, uh, which was uh, a fellow by the name of Zagoni was the guy in charge. So it's something called Zagoni's Charge. They basically charged into Springfield, but it was sort of a non event because most of the state guard had already moved south. Uh, but there were shooting and, and stuff going on. On the 31st of October, though, the governor has gotten enough of the state legislature together in the OSHA. He finally has a quorum, and they pass an ordinance of secession which is sent to uh, Richmond and accepted by, uh, by, by Davis. Uh, second, at the end of the 100 days, on 2nd November, Fremont's relieved by 100. He's only in power for, 18, for 16 days because he's relieved by Henry Wager Halleck. On the 28th of November, the Missouri is accepted in the Confederate States of the Army, and we are the 12th star. So if anyone asks you, did Missouri remain in the Union or did they join the Confederate States of America? The answer is yes, they did. For the duration? They did both. So, so from, from, the, from the Union's point of view, they didn't recognize the secession and they recognized their government, governor that they had put in office. And of course, we were in exile, so there wasn't really a whole lot that could be done. Jim, in answer to your question, yes, for the duration. Uh, another just a recruiting thing, Blackwater and Milford, guys coming from the north, were all assembled there. A huge number got captured and sent to, uh, to, to the uh, POW camps over here in St. Louis and across the river in Alton. Mount Zion Church, similar sort of thing. Now we get to the winter of 61 and 62. The original enlistments into the Missouri State Guard were for six months. So if you joined in June, come December, what's happening? Yeah. So the initial enlistments are up in December or January. Uh, many of the men are given furloughs to go home and deal with things. It's winter, it's winter now too, so there's not a lot of active campaigning. Going. However, because we have seceded, now they are setting up recruitment camps for Missouri Confederate. Uh, and there's 2,500 in actually considered considerate to have joined the Confederate Army uh, by the end of December. But there are still Missouri State Guard units going on this time. The next action is General Curtis, Samuel Curtis, starts approaching uh, Springfield. He finally gets his troops all in order and comes after Price. Causes Price to have to leave Springfield on the 12th of February. The Battle of Elkhorn Tavern. Northwest Arkansas occurs on the 6th and the 8th of March. Who wins this one? The Yankees beat us this one. This one. Uh, partly for poor leadership. Uh, because McCullough and Price didn't get along, 
they sent Earl Van Dorn to take over all command. He didn't do a great job of that. Um, but Pella has killed it. What happens after Elkhorn Tavern? Most of the Confederate, uh, excuse me, most of the Missouri forces, included, including those that are actually Confederate units now and those that are Missouri State Guard, cross the river intending to go help them down the Shiloh. They don't get there in time. They're there for the siege of Corinth, uh, but not for the actual battle of the Shiloh. So at Elkhorn Tavern, there were only about 1,600 men but about, because many of them had gone home for the winter. But about a month later, 15,000 of the second. And on the 17th of March, Price officially merges the State Guard with the Confederate States of America. But there are still State Guard units in Missouri operating independent. My ancestors were in uh, my United States. Under life. whose authority? Uh, it was still considered the State Guard. So, Although Price had merged, probably under Price's command because it had been merged with the CSA. Well, because the governor's in Texas at this point. So yeah, he may not have been all the way to Texas. He may have still been in Arkansas at this point. But, um, he is in exile. Certainly. Some of these are acting largely independent. Uh, uh, I'll cover that in just a second. After the siege of Corinth, a thousand state guard crossed the river with Price. A thousand crossed the river with Thompson. 700 of the State Guard men had come back to the Trans-Mississippi with General uh, Mosby and Parsons. But at this time, Curtis, after his victory at Pea Ridge, decides he's going to try and take Little Rock. So he moves back up into southern Missouri, moves east across southern Missouri to about uh, where Highway 63 goes now, goes through now at West Plains, and it heads south to Batesville. And he gets stopped by uh, the forces that Heinemann has constricted and thrown together to create a, a Confederate presence in Arkansas and southern Missouri because we're pretty much abandoned at this point in time. And everybody's going to cross the river. Okay. Now these conscripts, John, these are not necessarily volunteers. Some of them may have been desert. There was a lot of desertions as Price as they crossed the river. A lot of guys said, no, no, I, I signed on to protect I'm not going. So you'll see a lot of them are in their in their uh, official records. It'll say deserted, but then you'll find where they were fighting later uh, in Missouri. So Curtis's move on Little Rock had stopped, and my ancestors were in a, a cavalry regiment that was uh, uh, attacking all of his supply lines. He's got a real long supply line now because the supplies got to come to Rolla by train, but then they either got to go all down the wire road to Springfield and back around. Or south on the Rolla Houston Road, which goes all the way to uh, Batesville, I guess to Little Rock. Uh, and, and my ancestors were disrupting that, doing a very good job of it, actually. In fact, so good that he basically abandons his, his uh, uh, trying to get to Little Rock and goes to Helena instead, where he can be supplied from the river. Recruiting raids are still going on into Missouri now. Uh, on the 27th of July, General Order Number 19 is passed. That creates the Enrolled Missouri Militia. Probably the best recruiting thing that the uh, Unionists could have done for the Confederacy, because there were several uh, Missouri Confederate regiments that were formed almost right after this. But if you were still home, you had to enroll in this, whether you were loyal or disloyal. So it was really uh, a mess. Mooresville. Island Mound. Island Mound, by the way, in, uh, in western Missouri was the first battle of the Civil War where uh, African Americans were involved. They had come out of uh, Kansas, basically a foraging party that, that ran across uh, some state guard. Clarksville and Veracruz was sort of a combination of state guard and Confederate troops, as were a lot of these. Kirksville, Independence, Lone Jack. Most of these had to do, again, with recruiting uh, going into the state and trying to bring men back south. After 1862, after all this, though, the, the state guard activity is very sporadic. I mean, there's not a whole lot going on in Missouri in terms of Things are still going on in, in uh, Arkansas. Price actually makes it back to, uh, to 
to Arkansas and is in charge of Missouri troops uh, down there. Mem Jeff Thompson is still considered to be a Missouri State Guard officer at the surrender. He was never given a Confederate a commission for some reason, likely political or some sort. Uh, he, was, he did participate in Price's Raid. And I assume you all know about Price's Raid. So uh, there were remnants of the State Guard even then. Most of them were in CSA units, but there were some that were still considered, or two to three hundred that were actually still considered officially State Guard under General Reigns. Uh, the Confederates surrender in the Trans-Mississippi in late May of 65. And that's it. <laughs>